Hello and welcome to my channel. My name is David Novak. So for a change of pace from all of the gulag archipelagoing that I have been doing lately, I thought that I would read to you the introduction to the selected poems of Claude McKay written by Max Eastman, his friend. Now to call it an introduction is actually incorrect. Uh, although, if you can see it's placed at the fore, it is a biographical note. The original printing of this had an introduction written by another person, I believe surname Dewey, and it was so poor that when it came time to reprint this version of it, they just ejected that original introduction and placed the couple of pages by Max Eastman at the front as though it were an introduction. Now, this book has been mine for a long time, and when I wrote my book of sonnets, which I, uh, I suspect was in 1996, I'm not sure when I wrote it, um, I wrote a poem mentioning that I wish, and any poet would wish, to have an uh, introduction written for their poems, such as Max Eastman wrote for his friend Claude McKay. Um, so I was mistaken in thinking it was an introduction when I wrote that sonnet, thus the error was compounded. Um, no big matter, I suppose. Um, John Keats got the wrong explorer in one of his famous sonnets, and it does not hurt the sonnet in the least. Um, that said, I, I will read this to you, but you should be aware that um, despite um, the genuine love with which this biographical note was written, it is not free from what McKay's biographer Wayne Cooper referred to as unconscious condescension. Hold on a second. Okay. Don't want, don't want the camera tipped over if I can avoid that. It, I, it may not be recoverable. Um, he, I, I believe he, you know, he, he refers to McKay as the first genius of poetry which the African race has produced. This is obviously nonsense, <laughs> and I think it reflects the Anglo-centrism which was ubiquitous in that day. Uh, the speakers of English thought that English was it and anything else was not. So bear that in mind. Um, now, years ago, I believe that Wayne Cooper's biography of McKay was the only one that was available to me. Uh, a... Um, some years ago, I wrote an article about Claude McKay, which was um, published online, um, and I have the unedited version up at my website. And for that, I read a second biography of McKay, and I believe at this time you can probably find more um, biographies ab about McKay uh, available to you if you want to um, research him. His complete poems are also available, and it is a book that um, I bought and sadly returned because I was not pleased with it. Um, I didn't like how the poems were laid out on the page. They didn't look good, and then the editing of it did not seem uh, 
did not seem of, of the best quality to me. I returned the book to my regret because now the, uh, the price for that volume has gone up. Uh, it, it was a hardbound because I was so excited to get it as soon as it came out. Yeah. The, the, more, the more I take him down, the more he goes up. And if I put him in the back room, he'll start making a, a noise that will uh, disturb you to no end. So we'll just do the best we can with this. Um, <laughs> talking about McKay's biographies, I'm thinking about him a lot because I've been reading the Gulag Archipelago by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, and McKay uh, f did spend some time in communist Russia. Uh, at the end, he converted to Catholicism because he believed that Catholicism was the only force capable of withstanding communism, which he felt was an evil. Um, he himself admitted that he could have probably gone either way between uh, Roman Catholicism and uh, Islam. Uh, but he did ultimately choose uh, to become Catholic, and so I uh, respect his decision on that. This is the biographical note by Max Eastman. Claude McKay was most widely known, perhaps, as a novelist, author of Home to Harlem, a national bestseller in 1928. But he will live in history as the first great lyric genius that his race produced. He was a full-blooded African of middle height and dark chestnut color. In feature and expression, he strangely resembled a portrait of King Christopher of Haiti that was published many years ago in the London Illustrated News. His eyebrows arched high up and never came down, and his finely modeled features wore, in consequence, a fixed expression of ironical and rather mischievous skepticism. Claude was ironical and mischievous, too, and acutely intelligent both about people and politics. His laughter at the frailties of his friends and enemies, no matter which, that high, half-wailing, falsetto laugh of the restlessly delighted darky, was the center of my joy in him throughout our friendship of more than 30 years. Claude was born in 1890 in a little thatched farmhouse of two rooms in the hilly middle country of Jamaica in the West Indies. He learned in childhood how a family of his ancestors, brought over in chains from Madagascar, had kept together by declaring a death strike on the auction block. Each would kill himself, they vowed solemnly, if they were sold to separate owners. With the blood of such rebels in his veins and their memory to stir it, Claude McKay grew up proud of his race and with no disposition to apologize for his color. In his homeland, they call him Jamaica's Bobby Burns, and there is some reason for this. In both poets, the defiant pride of the social rebel, the militant Democrat, while nobly expressed, is on the whole overborne by a mood of all-embracing human tenderness. The sonnet, If We Must Die, in which he confronts the lynchers, is his most popular poem among the Negroes. But Harlem Shadows, the poem of pure compassion which first brought him attention in America, is a better lyric. And the sonnet he called Baptism is, I think, as fine an expression of the courage to endure anguish and grow stronger by it as we have in our language. Claude McKay came to America in 1912 and attended the Agricultural College of Kansas. His intention was to learn scientific farming and return to Jamaica to offer practical wisdom as well as song to his people. 
He studied for two years in Kansas, thinking continually less about farming and more about literature, and gradually losing out of mind the idea of returning to Jamaica. He left the college in 1914, knowing that he was a poet, and imagining, I guess, that he was a rather irresponsible and wayward character, to cast in his lot with the working-class Negroes of our North. He earned his living in every one of the ways the Northern Negroes do, from pot wrestling in a boarding house kitchen to dining car service on the New York and Washington Express. But like most poets, he failed to take earning a living very seriously. It was a matter of collecting enough money from each new job to quit for a while and sing. He was often homesick for Jamaica, and some of his best songs are made of the bright images that crowded in when he thought of his childhood home. Like a bluebird's note in a March wind, those sudden clear thoughts of the warm South ring out in the midst of his northern songs. Oh, something must be happening there this very minute. Underlying them all, I suppose, is a yearning for his wise and gentle mother, the moment of whose death he conveys into our heart with a simplicity that belongs only to the rarest of earth's wonders, the true-born lyric poet. His poems led to our meeting, and in a few years, he became my associate editor on The Liberator, a socialist magazine of art and literature. We were together in Moscow in 1923, both sympathetic to the Bolshevik Revolution, both unofficial visitors, however, and not fanatical. There being no Negroes in Russia, and one very much needed to demonstrate the new race solidarity, Claude was taken up and played up to a degree that would have turned the head of anyone not endowed at birth with those skeptical eyebrows. Adopted as a kind of mascot by the Red Army and Navy, entertained everywhere at the state's expense, given a Grand Duke's bedroom and study to live and work in, exhibited on tribunes with the great leaders and orators of the revolution, Claude certainly had the time of his life. But his mind was in command. He saw clearly the author authoritarian mechanism behind these spontaneous demonstrations, the regimentation, the bigotry, the sacrifice of personal dignity to the momentary needs of the state. In midstream of that flood of officially sponsored adulation, in which a less independent mind would have gone down. He composed a sonnet to St. Isaac's Church in Petrograd, which asserts in sublime opposition to the whole trend and essence of it, the divinity of the individual man. After a year in Russia, Claude went back to France and down to Morocco to live quietly and write books that had little to do with socialism but he did not conceal his contempt for the increasingly ruthless tyranny over man's mind and body that he saw growing out of the great revolution that had lifted him so high. He was not sucked in by the racial democracy for which so many of Stalin's American fellow travelers were willing to trade the substance of freedom for any man, black or white. His last years were passed in sickness. He could not write much, and he was destitute. One word on the communist side would have brought him ease, comfort, contemporary fame, and a good income. But he would not speak it. He chose instead to live in penury and watch his fame and popularity gradually disappear from the earth. A few years more, and he would have seen them rise again for his choice was as correct as it was courageous, and his place in the world's literature is unique and is assured. Uh, I feel like tearing up when I read that. It's, you, 
you read some of the um, introductions that other poets have had written for them. I, I believe there's a famous one that somebody had William Carlos Williams write for them, and none of them are like this. None of them. I mean, this is just magnificent. Uh, Max Eastman, I suppose, said a lot of things wrong in there, but um, the the love and esteem which he harbored for Claude was obviously genuine. And it's something that I've thought about sharing for a while. I believe I mentioned it in a former video. And since I am reading Alexander Solzhenitsyn, Claude McKay has been very much in my mind in his autobiography. He you can read that he was uh, an associate of Sylvia Pankhurst, I believe, and read of some incidents that happened to him uh, while he was there, I believe. Um, so that I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for stopping by.